The Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. Hello and welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. My name is Josh Edison, located for your convenience in Auckland, New Zealand. That other attractive looking person there is one Dr. M. Dentith, located also for your convenience in Bucharest, Romania. I am very conveniently located in Romania. Mm, mm. I think Many so. people talk about the convenience of my location. Mm. My location is just one of the most convenient things in the world. I'm just going to keep saying the word convenient until such time you stop me, so please stop me now. Okay. Convenient. It's, it's, it's good because, you know, man, wherever you go, there you are. There you are. Mm. Ah, Buckaroo Banzai. And I assume it must have been before him, surely. <laughs> No, just what... History started with no. Bakarai Benzai and adventures across the eighth dimension. That is literally the beginning of human history. Actually, yes, everything before that. that was just mm. was just a a discarded Hollywood screenplay. Mm. Uh, in more recent history, uh, astute viewers will notice that there was not a proper episode last week. Maybe you you fell into some sort of accidental coma and came out of it now, not realising that a week's time had passed while you were unconscious and are therefore unaware that a full two weeks has relapsed since the um, the last episode. But for the rest of you, it has indeed been two weeks. What um, what have you been up to, or are we not worthy to know of your extracurricular activities, we non-patrons? You're suggesting I've been up to something? What I mean, what are you suggesting, Joshua? I, I, I'm outright saying that you, sir, are part of the Bilderberg group and that you've been sending out shady communiques to all those of us, or, or all those of you who are uh, patrons donating to our cause while everyone else has been left out in the cold, not, not worthy of being part of your new world order, I assume. Now, what, what kind of evidence do you have for this frankly scandalous, libellous, defamatory, and also spectacular claim? Um, the, the, the fact that even though uh, patron-only podcast episodes uh, are not listenable to anyone, they do appear to all show up in your Twitter feed when you publish one. So I have been seeing okay. you as updates about you are... Bucharest, and I'm in Bucharest. Hey, the, the view in Bucharest is very nice here, and things like that. Not Bucharest. Bucharest? Bilderberg. Bilderberg. That's where you normally are, Bucharest. See, your Bilderberg. story doesn't make any sense, Joshua. You're just, it's what you seem to be erecting the it's tissue a of life. It's a campaign of information. The claim that I went to the Hotel de Bilderberg over the weekend for a conspiracy theory conference where I talked about Romanian conspiracy theories, that is not a bald-faced lie that actually is completely true. Mm. And it is also true that I have been making patron-only podcasts about my time at the Hotel de Bilderberg. And the fact there is an overabundance of Henry Kissinger portraits and quotes on the walls of that hotel. And mm. maybe or maybe I didn't find the sacrificial pits in which they sacrificed the children to their elder and arcane god. Those things may or may not have happened whilst I was at the Hotel de Bilderberg. Did they, though? I can't say, okay. unless you're willing to pledge at least a dollar a month to our podcast. You and then you can find out about the fun and excitement that I had at the Hotel de Bilderberg, home of the Bilderberg Group, and apparently a shrine to the not-yet-dead Henry Kissinger. Yes, um, photographs of which you can see on your Instagram, or Insta, as I believe the children say. Whose children? The, the children, just in general, all of them, at once, in unison. It's kind of spooky when they do it, actually. That's why I don't have kids. Mm. Well, you probably you dodged a bullet there. Um, anyway, speaking of bullet-dodging children and their hijinks in the Bilderberg Hotel, uh, that has nothing to do with the news update, but we should probably do the news update. We should. Breaking, breaking conspiracy theories in the news. We begin once again with our new favourite minced oath, Hitler's teeth. You wash your mouth out, young man. What prompted that effusion of potty mouth? Uh, Hitler's teeth. His, his actual teeth. They've been in the news again. What are they up to this time, those wacky tentacular rascals, those canine crazies, those molar munters? Well, you'll recall that a few episodes ago... <clears throat> Let's start that again. Well, you'll recall... Ah, oh, yes, clever. Yep. 
Well, you'll recall that a few episodes ago we talked about how Russian agents were tasked with authenticating Hitler's dental remains immediately after World War, World War II and succeeded in doing so, and then how Stalin ordered their results covered up to promote post-war uncertainty. Now, a team of French researchers has just had another go at analysing what little is left of Hitler's corpse, and you won't believe what they found out. That Hitler's really dead? Uh, well, um, yes. Uh, yes, all right, I guess you would believe it um, quite easily. After comparing the few available skull and tooth fragments to autopsy records of the time, they concluded, in the words of co-author Philippe Chalier, there is no possible doubt. Our study proves that Hitler died in 1945. He did not flee to Argentina in a submarine. He is not in a hidden base in Antarctica or on the dark side of the moon. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Suchet. <coughs> Uh, an uncannily accurate representation and a little too specific in his denials there, if you ask me. The study also concludes that German propaganda immediately after Hitler's death, which claimed that the Fuhrer died valiantly in battle, is also untrue. It was Chancellor Hitler in the bunker with the pistol and possibly cyanide pill. Well, I'm glad that's settled for now. In that case, we can continue by revisiting the other doomed Malaysia Airlines flight. Now, last episode, we had a look back at the case of flight MH370. But you may recall that 2014 was a particularly bad year for Malaysia Airlines, as its flight MH17 was shot down over the Ukraine a few months after MH370's disappearance. At the time, there was much argument over whether the offending missile had been fired by Ukrainian forces firing Russian weapons, or by Russian forces fighting in Ukraine, or Russian forces in Russia firing over the border into Ukraine. Um, it all got quite confusing. But confusing no more, as an international team of investigators has claimed that they have ample evidence to prove that the missile was fired by Russian forces, specifically the 53rd Anti-Aircraft Missile Brigade based in Kursk in Western Russia. It's not a done deal yet, though, um, as the Joint Investigation Team has notably not claimed that the missile was deployed deliberately as part of a military mission. Uh, having pinpointed its origin, they're now hoping to get a whistleblower with specific knowledge of the incident to come forward and give evidence that would confirm how and why it was fired. Meanwhile, Russia continues to deny responsibility for the downing, insisting that none of its missiles had ever crossed the border into the Ukraine, and is using its veto in the UN to block any sort of international tribunal regarding the matter from being set up. Ah, that Putin, he'll be the death of us. He, he will literally be the death of us. But back to Malaysia, there's more MH370 news. Yes, so people continue to react to the recent 60 Minutes piece. Uh, we've seen a resurrection of the what were they carrying on board the plane conspiracy theory, which argues that we still don't know what was in storage on MH370 when it disappeared, which raises the question, was it something in the hold which caused the disappearance? Now, the Malaysian government says we do know what was in storage, but families of the missing passengers aren't happy with the vague claim a large section of the hold was filled with radio accessories and charges. Hmm. Meanwhile, Christine Negroni claims that the 60 Minutes report and the associated book it was promoting ignores a vital piece of evidence, the only bit of MH370 thus far recovered. The wing flap, which washed ashore, according to Negroni, a aircraft crash investigator, puts paid to the murder-suicide and associated Malaysia Airlines cover-up theory of Larry Vance. The flapperon not a euphemism, was stowed and not extended, which indicates the plane was not set for a controlled ditching at the end of the flight. Negroni thinks this is the best evidence for the widely held view that the plane suffered a mass decompression event which led to the crew and passengers eventually passing out due to hypoxia. The pilots would have been incapable of making sensible flight decisions, which in turn makes predicting the whereabouts of the plane's eventual crash into the ocean near impossible, as there's no guarantee it would have travelled in a straight line. Take that, 60 minutes. Meanwhile, let us travel to China. Yes. In news which was surprising and embarrassing to both the Prime Minister of New Zealand and the man who wants to replace her, US Congress members recently heard that not only is China seeking to influence politics in Australasia, but Aotearoa New Zealand is failing to do anything about it. 
A former CIA intelligence analyst told Congress that not only was the New Zealand Labour Party getting donations from Chinese political groups, but that the National Party had a Chinese political operative as an MP. Whatever former Prime Minister Bill English told ZNP was being sent directly to Beijing. Now, both the leaders of the Labour Party and the National Party are denying this. Labour claims that all donations are above board, and National claims that the suspect MP has been cleared numerous times when similar accusations were made before and during the election campaign of last year. But this does speak to our earlier discussion several podcasts ago of Chinese cultural imperialism. And it is slightly amazing that the US Congress is so fussed by this apparent infiltration of our own government when they seem totally unfazed by claims Russia has infiltrated their own executive. I guess it's easier to be a conspiracy theorist about other people than it is about your own political family. And now back to the US via China, we're really racking up those air miles. Yes, you may recall that many, many aeons ago, back when dinosaurs ruled the Earth in their UFOs, we talked about the suspected sonic weapon being used against US staff at the Cuban em at the embassy in Cuba. Cuban embassy in Cuba? That sounds redundant. I'll take it. Anyway, the threat has gone global. A Department of State employee has reported similar symptoms in Beijing, leading to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo to claim the incident was medically similar to the suspected attacks in Cuba. The US has not directly implicated China in the attacks, but it has rescinded its invitation to China to participate in the forthcoming Rim of the Pacific naval exercise. Which is not a euphemism. No, it, it, it really isn't. I note that these attacks occur in nations whose names start with a C. Coincidence? Coincidence starts with a C. So does conspiracy. Yes, which brings us back to the US again. Donald J. Trump has managed to get the Department of Justice to expand their investigation into the presidential election to see if the FBI infiltrated or surveilled the Trump campaign for political purposes. It all seems like a distraction from the ongoing political probe into the Russia collusion thesis, and that by painting the FBI as political operatives rather than investigators, whatever result the Mueller inquiry comes up with can be recast into a much more sympathetic light for Donald J. Trump. We could go into further depth on this one, but Trump news has a habit of making my bile mix with my stomach acids. Em, can you give us the lowdown in eight and a half words? Uh... Collusion is still collusion, even if other things happen. And that's all the time we have. Well, all the time we can commit to, we have a population number to control after all. So we're going to be talking about the population and the population number. So I think it's really important to get our cards on the table to see whose teams we're playing for. Josh, you're a progenitor. How many kids have you had? Two. That I know of. Dun, dun, dun. No, it's just well, I am a non-progenitor. I've produced no children. So I'm definitely on team population control, and Josh is definitely on team let's go wild. Is that correct? Uh, well, no. That we're, we're, We've purely replaced ourselves, my wife and I. So we're, 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 we're population neutral, I think. You're saying there's a third team. I've, I've, this is this is just breaking my entire epistemic and ontological commitment. Well, I have I mean, no idea what's going on there. Up is down, cat to having sex with dogs. And is that a UFO outside? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, I can only assume. I mean, of, of course, should my two children each go on to have two children, then I will have uh, the, the, the whole exponential thing will, will do its, will have its wacky way. And uh, so, yes, I probably am actually responsible um, for the, the looming overpopulation of our fair planet. And I've suddenly just realized there's a really, really horrible question I could have just asked there, and I'm just not going to because it's considered to be impolite. Mm. Very well, then. Good thing that you didn't. Did it involve the donkey? We promised not to talk about that. It was alive yeah, when I left it. <clears throat> anyway. Uh, that's, that is medically not clear from the autopsy report that I've seen. But anyway, let's, let's move on. Yeah, let's move the donkey on, is an issue that can be dealt with behind closed doors. By the proper authorities, yes. Um, or the improper authorities in this particular case. Mm. Why clowns investigate these crimes, I do not know. Yeah, who else is going to? Um, 
Now, now you might recall a few episodes ago when we were we were we were basically amusing ourselves by taking the piss out of a, an article on wakeupkiwi.com, uh, talking about all the different ways the the new world order is out to get you. At one point, when they talked about um, how you shouldn't join the military, they said that uh, the elite's wars are secretly manufactured for power, profit, political gain, and a planned population reduction agenda, um, which. I, not being as well versed in conspiracy theories as you, thought that, that, that people think there are planned population control reduction agendas. Uh, the only thing I'd heard of that was an, epi an issue of the comic Global Frequency by Warren Ellis, where, where, where there the, 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 the team of secret special agents encounter a plan by uh, governments to, to chuck kinetic harpoons at the world and blow up large sections of its population. But um, having had a look around, uh, th there's a fair few more conspiracy theories out there that the that those wacky New World Order One government fellows have plans in store to wipe out large sections of the population. And indeed, these theories are actually quite old. So the Marquis de Sade, in his published works, many of the plots and capers in his novels concern groups within the French polity wanting to put poisons into the water supply to reduce the population down. So population control or population elimination conspiracy theories actually go back at least as far as the French Revolution, if not earlier. Mm. And I suppose they're distinct from the uh, sort of eugenics conspiracy theories, which we have talked about before, because those are, I mean, they're not really trying to curb the growth of the population overall. They're just trying to sort of mould it to their will, so that, which does involve letting certain parts of the population die out while breeding up other parts. But um, it's, not, it's not really about, um, it, it's sort of having, having the right kind of people in scare quotes, rather than um, actually knocking numbers back. Um, so we're, we're, should we start with the how or the why? They're both interesting questions. Let's start with the why and then work up to how we can do it once we've got a sufficient justification for eliminating 75% of the human population by the end of this podcast. Hmm. I mean, well, first of all, you've got your the, the, the sort of more lefty conspiracy, or rather conspiracy theories that the right have about the left, the, all, all those um, environmentalists. Um, because as we all know, human beings take a toll on the environment, and if you're being strictly sort of utilitarian about it, um, the best thing we could do for the environment is to cease existing. So there are some theories which say that these population reduction agendas are by um, wacky, hippie, greeny environmentalists who want to save the planet by killing off as many humans as they can. Um, on the other side, you've got the... Um, possibly more common, I don't know, I haven't done a full survey, but um, fr from from what I've read, more common theories, which is simply that um, the powers that be, the, the New World Order, they're all about control, they want us fully under their thumb, um, and the more of us there are, the harder we are to control. So if they can uh, eventually, at some point, when they've, they have judged that the population is starting to become too unwieldy, they're going to roll out their preferred population reduction method and have a, have a good cull of we... Actually, a phrase which apparently pops up a lot of the time is useless eaters. That's what they think of us. Our, our NWO global masters. All, all we are is just a bunch of useless eaters just sitting around consuming resources and not, not, not performing any good. Um, supposedly that particular phrase first showed up during the Holocaust in German. Uh, it was, I wasn't smart enough to write it down, but it was something fressen, which is uh, interesting and in that the German word for eat is essen. The German verb fressen uh, is eat it, it applies to animals, basically. It's it's what it's the it's the verb used to describe an animal feeding rather than a human eating. So, being dehum a dehumanizing phrase right from the start. Um, now, if we're looking at the kind of political left and right distinctions here, it is interesting to note that when you get the left wing version of this hypothesis that environmentalists, ecologists, and the like want to reduce the population down, there's a certain anti-capitalist streak to these particular types of conspiracy theories because a certain specter in right-wing populist economics 
is based upon the infinite growth hypothesis, that we need large populations to produce more capital, to be able to produce more wealth, and thus if we have a large population and a large material base, everything gets better to everyone through infinite growth. And so the idea that there are elements on the left who want to curb the population just goes to show they don't understand how markets work. Now, this is, of course, a facile, overly generalistic portrayal of these particular types of economic motifs. But, of course, often the kind of people who are putting forward the left want to control our population aren't exactly economic wizards. They don't quite understand the economic theory they're talking about, but they use it as a hammer to hammer against the left. Mm. And I think you could possibly say the same about the other um, conspiracy theories as well. I mean, as you say, looking at capitalism, like our capitalist, our capitalist overlords, um, whether, whether you think that's shadowy figures in a smoky room or just the likes of your your Jeff Bezos's and Tim Cooks and uh, that guy who owns IKEA, who I think is one of the richest people in the world, um, they, they don't see us as eaters. They see us as consumers. They they want us. They want as many of us as they can, surely, so that we can can a work for them and make money for them, and b spend money on the stuff that they make. Um, and this idea that uh, cutting down the population drastically will will make us will make the surviving population easier to control, at least from an economic standpoint, it um it doesn't really doesn't really stand up. Um, because a smaller workforce means less competition, which is generally good for the for the workforce. It means sort of higher wages, more more bargaining power. Um, I, I'm going to quote rationalwiki.org here because they, they put this better than I can when they talked about how um, the, the Black Death during the Middle Ages, which did wipe out a massive chunk of the population without anyone having to try, or did they? Um, dun, dun, dun. And the effects it had, they said, I'm quoting here, <clears throat> The massive labour shortage caused by the plague meant that the peasants had more land, craftsmen had fewer competitors, new labour-saving technologies spread to compensate for the loss of so much of the labour force, and feudal lords had to compete for peasants' loyalty lest they switch allegiance to a new lord offering a better deal. While the Roman Catholic Church faced a severe crisis in confidence, his prayer seemed wholly ineffective at stopping the ravages of the plague. The Europe that emerged from the Black Death was not the old one that had been dominated by the elites of the medieval era, but conversely one with a levelled playing field where the elite its power was sharply curtailed and where agricultural, industrial, economic, religious and intellectual revolutions loomed around the bend. So certainly historically, um, when a large chunk of the population dies off, uh, that, that doesn't mean that um, we become more under the thumb of the, the authorities of the time. So what you're saying is we should engage in mass slaughter to improve the lot of the plebeian class. I like your thinking here, Joshua. This sounds fantastic. We should engage in mass slaughter immediately. Of course, possibly to to um, give these theories a little bit of credit, maybe they're not just talking about uh, wiping out all the all the people who do the work for the, the, the global NWO people, I, I can imagine what they're probably thinking of is that the NWO get all their all their um, forces of authority, all the armies and police forces and whatever, who are completely under their control, uh, wipe out a large chunk of the population while keeping the population of the armies and the police forces the same. So the idea is that, that the ratio of authority to populace becomes more favourable to the authority. But still, at the end of the day stuff's going to need to get done and when there's a hell of a lot less people to do it that's that's going to cause problems i have also and indeed it makes me think of the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy where the golga frenchians get rid of a useless third of the population and then succumb to a disease got from a dirty telephone because there are no more telephone sanitizers mm -hmm. around sometimes you have to have someone to clean your phone you do. Have you looked at your cell phone recently? I bet it's filthy. Oh, it totally is. It's new, actually. I got a new phone, and within a day, it's covered in smudgy fingerprints and who the hell knows what. That will be because you have children, though. There's, a, there's an amount of that, yes. Um, 
I've also I've heard versions of this theory that talk about how um, the plan is to concentrate, sort of talking about urban migration and seeing something sinister in the fact that supposedly they're trying to suck everyone out of the rural areas and concentrate them all in the cities where they'll also be under control. But we need people in rural areas because that's where our food comes from. So I don't see I don't see that sort of theory working out particularly well in the in the long run either. I mean, you could argue that maybe given the investment of so much property and money in the 1%, given the malformed nature of the modern economy, that standard economic theories no longer apply. The elites just don't need a massive population now. They hold all the wealth. They hold all of the power. They can quite happily get rid of consumers because they're sitting on so much wealth now, they literally don't need to generate any more. Yeah. And especially if they don't plan to have children or continue their line, they can have 40 to 60 years of absolute luxury without having to worry about a population fomenting revolt against them. Well, yes, I suppose in that, in that scenario where the remaining people are what? Just their, their indentured slaves fully subjugated to their evil will. Um, I'm not sure if we're making these theories more or less plausible. Um, it's also interesting to see that if, 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 we, if we take these um, conspiracy theories at their word, that there are these um, shadowy plans by shadowy one world government types to reduce a large chunk of the population, you do have to wonder why the, the, the real governments, or at least the visible governments, the ones that we actually see working every day, by and large seem to be trying to do the exact opposite. Um, Obviously, it's true that genocides have occurred in human history. Um, look at the likes of Cambodia, Rwanda, uh, the ethnic cleansing in, around Bosnia uh, back in the 90s. Uh, th this Germany in the happened. 40s. Well, indeed. Uh, but, but in all of those cases, that was basically uh, r racism or tribalism. It was, it was one bunch trying to get rid of another bunch who they didn't like. It wasn't... Um, it, it, it was it was it was more along the lines of the eugenic stuff than the population control stuff. It wasn't about reducing the numbers. It was about getting rid of the ones we don't like, so there's more room for the ones that we do like. Um, and let less extreme examples aside, when you look at what governments are doing these days, and predominantly in history, that they want more people. Capitalism wants more people. Um, governments in developed countries all tend to have some version of a welfare state that um, offers assistance or, or tax cuts or something like that um, to people who do have families. It's been, in some cases, um, there have even been instances where uh, there have been extra taxes on people who didn't have children. I believe none other than, than Joseph Stalin himself. Uh, instituted a plan in Russia for population growth, where there were tax breaks to people with families and extra taxes or something to people who had no children. Um, so if, 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 if no less than Joseph Stalin was um, out promoting population growth rather than trying to cull it, um, one wonders what the hell was going on there. I mean, the only one you can really point a finger at that I know of is China's one-child policy, which um, I believe they've abandoned, and which isn't nearly as universal as, as people think as well. It, would, it only applied to certain, certain ethnic groups, um, and overall was only really compulsory for, I think, less than half the population. Um, and again, that's abolished now, because basically... Um, yes, it's all well and good to, to worry about resources and, and better distribution of them and so on, but really what an economy wants is more, 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 more. Whether that's a good thing or not uh, is possibly another answer. They want useful eaters. Mm. And, 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 and I like to think we are. So um, if the motives and, and the reasoning behind these conspiracies are little, is a little suspect, um, I shudder somewhat to think at the proposed mechanisms behind this population that we, that, uh, re reduction that we're going to see. What, what do people think is going to cause this massive die-off in the human population? 
Well, I mean, we could take a page from the seminal work Watchmen and the idea that you might create a false flag event to get people united under, say, a universal government and then use that as a control mechanism for control of the population. But yes, how are we going to restrict population numbers down? And there we see a lot of dovetailing with other conspiracy theories. So people talk about fluoride in the water and that effect on IQ. But a recent theory about fluoride relates to uh, dwindling population demographics, particularly in the West, because Westerners are not producing as many children as they used to. Fertility rates in the West are going down. And some people are going, hmm, this suggests the population control agenda is already being enacted. They're putting something in the water or they're putting something in our food to reduce our population. Yes. Yes. And some of these theories are, uh, are more extreme than others. There are some that say, um, yes, they're, they're just going to um, yeah, engineer wars to wipe out lots of people. They're going to engineer diseases, the likes of AIDS or or Ebola have been suggested as, you know, d diseases that have been either manufactured or if not manufactured, then sort of cultured and deliberately released um, as a method of, of um, dropping population numbers. Um, but there are also the theories that say, well, they're not, they're not actually, they're not all going to come out, round us up and kill us off. That would be too obvious and would provoke a resistance and so on. What they're really doing is just lowering fertility rates. Um, Shape, shaping demographics or, or populations as a whole by doing very by, by through various methods slipping us those naughty chemicals that will make us all sterile uh, or turn us all gay wasn't didn't Alex what did Alex Jones say about gay frogs what was his thing there's there? something in the water where there are hormones in the water which are turning frogs gay yes and apparently that's that's wrong. I don't know why Alex Jones thinks that a population of gay frogs is an affront to nature and human civilization. Frankly, the more gay frogs, the better, I say. Gay frogs are as worthy in my society as non-gay frogs. I assumed all frogs were gay. They don't, don't they all um, sing show tunes with the top hat and cane going, Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, my ragtime gal. I, I think that's that only back home. Uh, I think frogs elsewhere in the world don't don't do that. I admit I haven't actually seen any frogs in Romania. Maybe they're more they they're more into scat in Romania. So maybe the frogs are yes. and they wear berets. I mean, I don't know. I actually don't know that much about frogs, truth be told. No, no, neither do I. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so there are these ideas that uh, that they'll they'll make us sterile. Now, at this point, there's there's also the claims, of course, you see among certain sort of far-right white supremacist types that there's this white genocide going on. Uh, and when they say genocide, they kind of mean lowering birth rates among among sort of white people, while perhaps the birth rates in other countries or in other ethnic um, groups is staying stable or going up, um, which is a funny definition of genocide, but it is um, it is the kind of thinking you do get uh, in some of these theories as well, that, that it's causing uh, either large sections or certain demographics of, popu of the population to die off um, through through sort of more eugenic-y, sterilization-y means. But, um, Although I think you're being a little bit too generous there to the white I, supremacists, well, well, I because am. not only are they talking about dwindling population demographics, they're also talking about so-called interbreeding, that white people well, yes. are having sex with people of colour, and then the children, the children have the temerity, it is claimed, to then identify as people of colour and to reject their white ancestors. So they're worried about a white genocide, which is not just dwindling population demographics in the West, which is something which has been studied by population specialists and bi biologists, but they're also worried about identity politics mm. and the fact that children who might have a person of colour in their ancestry might identify as a person of colour themselves. Which seems strange to me because generally they'd be promoting the exact opposite, surely. I mean, race race obviously is, is a, a cultural construct, not a scientific one, and therefore it behaves in theological ways. And generally certainly when you're talking to your white supremacists, 
whiteness is largely associated with purity, so I would have thought in the eyes of a white supremacist, um, a person of mixed race is not white by definition. So it would seem odd for them to be turning around and blaming them for identifying as, as not white anyway. Those well, it's not just blaming them for being not white, it's know. also blaming them for daring to have parents who had sex uh, with someone who go. isn't white. Look, so I'm sorry, but it sounds like you're suggesting that white supremacists might not be entirely sensible and rational. And that's, that's just blowing my mind, man. I'm, an, I'm sorry to say, but that is a hill I'm willing to die on. Ah, uh, oh well. I guess I'll just have to go with it. Um, so what else? I, I think you can pretty much go down the list of conspiracy theories and tick them all off when it comes to um, population control. They're doing it with fluoride. They're doing it with chemtrails. They're doing it with vaccines. They're doing it with the diseases that the vaccines cause. Um, Agenda 21 is going to do it. There's one I hadn't heard of before, Codex Alimentarius. Had you heard of this before? Yes, yes, I have, was, I have heard of it. It was new to me, and does, I like the sound yeah. of it. Codex Elementarius, not um, some sort of book of magical spells. Uh, it's actually just a plan involving sort of food sta standards around food and food production and food safety, sort of food labeling standards and so on. And like Agenda 21, it's sort of one of those guidelines. It's not a law. It's not something that anyone's forced to do. But I believe the world... Um, WTO, uh, uh, is it the World Trade Organization? I think it was, yes. Uh, uses it as a guideline when it comes to food stuff, things like that. So, but, but again, that's something, oh, they're going to kill us all off because it's it's actually this, this, this thing to withhold all the food and starve us all or something like that. Um, or they think that, yes, the government force is just going to come out and, and j just plain kill us all. What did people think was going to happen at those FEMA death camps around Hurricane Katrina and all that? Oh, well, yes, it was the idea that the government had pre-prepared coffins. Ipso facto, they knew the deaths were going to occur ahead of time, which is kind of not understanding that FEMA has to be prepared for disasters and prepared for disasters that might never come. You can't have a disaster and then go, oh, we need 5,000 coffins. Just let those bodies rot over in the corner whilst we spend seven days preparing these things. Mm. FEMA always has a stock of things ready to go, but of course it does look rather sinister when you then drive past a FEMA repository and go, hmm, that's an awful lot of coffins there. That's an awful lot of coffins. And the fact that they're really close to railway stations for fast transit of these materials around the country does have the unfortunate association with what happened during the Holocaust. But actually, I want to go back to things like the Codex, because there's an awful lot of stuff here where guidelines or simply proclamations made by individuals are then inferred as being statements of the New World Order. And I think the best example of this are the Georgia Guidestones. Ah, yes. Now, Tell me about those. the Georgia Guidestones are kind of America's really tiny Stonehenge. Uh, they're found in Albert County in Georgia. They were erected back in the 1980s. No one actually knows who the author or authors or funders of the Guidestones were, but they have... Ten guidelines. Uh, these are inscribed in eight different languages, which are English, Spanish, Swahili, Sanskrit, Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, and Russian. And the guidelines start with, number one, maintain humanity under 500 million in, oh, sorry, 500 billion. No, sorry, That's no, it is 500, 500 million. million. Yep. I'm, getting my, I'm oh. getting my numbers wrong. Mm in perpetual balance with nature. And then it goes on to claim things like guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity, avoid petty laws and useless officials, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes in a world court, protect people with nations with fair laws and just courts, and prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite. Now, this is a private monument. No one knows who it belongs to or who wrote it. But this hasn't stopped a certain stripe of conspiracy theorists. It's going, aha, here's evidence of what the New World Order wants to do. This is their monument. And it's recently become a talking point with those wacky rascals, those funny scamps who are behind QAnon. 
Mm. Yes, because it does tick quite a few of your NWO, con NWO conspiracy theory boxes, population limits, guiding reproduction, uh, and, and um, yes, world court. Oh, I think there's also unite humanity with a living new language. L lots of lots of things that could be construed as advocating a one world government. So I can understand why people would look at it and go, oh, see, this is their plan all along. I understand the monument's been defaced more than once by people painting various no death to N NWO type slogans on it, become a bit of a touchstone. Although, yes, basically they erected in the 80s, they just kind of sit there. They don't appear to be anything more than the principles of some, I'm assumingly, well-intentioned crackpots with too much money. Um, but, but, but again, it's, it's another one of those, um, the, the NWO are working in secret to do these horrible things and also publishing their plans on giant stone blocks um, in the middle of Georgia. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting way of acting in secret. I must admit, when I think of the New World Order, I think of Georgia. Mm. So, I think our time is coming to an end, and I think we've possibly reached the limits of it. Um, the, the, the motives behind, the, the purported motives behind uh, population control conspiracy theory seem a little bit questionable, and the methods are no, more, no less questionable than the methods of pretty much any other conspiracy theory you care to name, except, except the one most insidious conspiracy theory that I think we've seen so far, which was said by some guy commenting on someone else's Instagram photo, who, which was then taken a screenshot of and passed around the internet in the, in the usual way, which means that nobody actually knows exactly where it came from in the first place. But the quote is, the globalists are using cats to depopulate whites. Because cats act as surrogate babies, they cause white women not to want to have kids. Cats are like a parasite that sucks the maternal instinct from white women. That frankly chills me to my core. I own a cat. I didn't know it was sucking the maternal instinct from from my white woman. But now I, I so I have to assume if you didn't have a cat, you would have seventeen I'd just more be children. And children, I'd be I'd be just tripping over them in the street. They'd be everywhere. But those wacky NWOs with their cat population control. Only white women, though. I personally am white, um, and I do own a cat, but I'm fairly certain that people of any colour are able to own a cat. Am, am, am I wrong in that? And I'm also fairly sure that human behaviour towards cats is fairly universal. I don't know there's something special about, and we have to put air quotes around this for people who are listening to the podcast and not watching it, Anything specific about white biology, there's no mm. such thing as yes, white no, biology, yes. that makes cats particularly good at making the hormonal response that makes some people want to have children go away? It's, I mean, I'd love to see some lab studies. I'd love to see lab the lab. Studies. Because it's, and we introduced a cat into this room, and suddenly the woman decided she didn't want children. In this room, we introduced a monitor lizard. And that also caused the woman to not want to have children by being dead mm. when she was eaten by the monitor lizard. So In this room, a kangaroo. You want lab studies when we already have a comment some dude wrote on an Instagram photo. I, like, I don't no, even no, know. No, no, you're that. right, you're right. The science is settled. The mm. science is settled. The Insta, Insta, Joshua, Insta. the Insta comment is Never precisely liked. what we need to know. Mm. So there you have it. I think we've come to a, a perfectly logical conclusion that cats will be the death of us all. And frankly, I think we already always uh, suspected that. That's true. Mm. So have, have you any last thoughts before we sign out? No, just that population control conspiracy theories, as I said at the beginning, are quite old. They go back at least as far as the French Revolution. People have been concerned that elites are seeking to reduce the population down. But as you point out, the actual logistics of it doesn't really seem to suit the elites, given that the elites actually do require a labor force. I was thinking, actually, when we were talking about the whole economic aspect, it also dovetails in quite nicely with another conspiracy theory here, which is that 
unemployment numbers have to be kept at a certain threshold within any economy to allow the elites in this case the employers, to have power over workers. Because when you have unemployment, that means there's a lot of competition in the marketplace, which means that employers can offer worse deals to potential employees than they would do if there was a overemployment issue. And of course, that's a related conspiracy theory here that goes, look, you need a large population. And that large population is useful because there's only a certain number of jobs that population can do. And people are going to scrabble for those jobs and they will take any scraps that they can get. Yes, you want the people fighting amongst themselves for resources. That way they won't be able to fight against you when you come to enact your filthy will upon them. Um, so there you have it. Population conspiracy theories. Um, they're all true and we're all going to die. It's true. You are all going to die. Although those of us who have been to the Hotel de Bilderberg, we don't. Not so much. No, no. Well, with that cheery thought... Uh, I think then perhaps it is best to bid you goodbye from the podcaster's guide to the conspiracy. Uh, my name is Josh Edison. And I am Dr. M.R. Extenteth, and my final word is going to be commandment number 10 from the Georgia Guidestone. Be not a cancer on the earth. Leave room for nature. Leave room for nature. Or as noted philosophers Bill and Ted said, be excellent to each other. Goodbye. Rock on, dudes. You've been listening to the podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. It is written, researched, and performed by Josh Addison, a.k.a. Monkey Fluids, and M.R.X. Denteth, a.k.a. Conspiracism on Twitter. This podcast is available where all good podcasts can be found, as well as iTunes, Podbean, and Stitcher. It can also be watched on YouTube. Just search for the podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, or, if you happen to be technophobic, consult the auguries. You can support the podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy via our Patreon page, as listed in the podcast description, or just by searching for us on Patreon. You can also support us via the Podbean patronage system, if that is more your style. You do you. If you want to get in contact with us, why not email us at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or find us on Facebook. And remember, Soylent Green is meeples. <laughs>